Today we're speaking with Dr. Chi Van Dang. He is the Professor of Medicine, Cell Biology, Oncology, and Pathology, the Johns Hopkins Family Professor, and Vice Dean for Research at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His plenary talk is Oncogenic Reprogramming of Metabolism and Therapy. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Dang. Your lab is focused on how oncogenic alterations in cancers lead to altered tumor metabolism. Would you begin by describing requirements of tumor cells and the links to common pathway alterations in cancer? Right. So for many years, we know that alterations of oncogenes and tumor suppressors, so the accelerators and brakes, leads to deranged cells that continues to divide. And I think uh, over the last 10 years, what's become apparent um, now that we know how the brakes and accelerators work, is that the fuel line, uh, as always, has got to be there to also fuel the cell, not only to provide energy, but really the building blocks. So cancer cells are going to use this deranged mechanisms of accelerated growth. And so the question in the field has been, uh, are these two processes distinctly different processes, or are they tied to each other? So are these accelerators and brakes really linked right to the fuel line? And in fact, what we find is that if you go back and expand on the literature, um, you look at many different oncogenes now are known to be linked to key metabolic pathways. Uh, the particular oncogene I'm interested in is MYC, although not limited to that. But basically what we found is that if you look at oncogenes, um, not only do these genes are major switches that allow cells to wake up and really go through the cell cycle, but at the same time, many of these oncogenes can be connected directly to metabolic pathways. And what I mean by this is that uh, cells, um, when they exist and they're not growing, they still need energy to be maintained, because if there's not enough energy, the cells will basically undergo entropy and dissipate and die. So there's always a, a certain amount of energy that's, that's uh, um, required for cells to maintain its structure. And so there's a lot of turnover of proteins to this. Once the cells are stimulated to grow, then it wakes up, in, especially if you look at the normal cells, that when it wakes up, it has to bring in the appropriate amount of energy as well as building blocks, then using the genetic program then to build the components of the cells and then replicate DNA and finally undergo division and divide into two cells. Uh, what we understand now is that the normal precursors of oncogenes, proto-oncogenes or tumor suppressor genes that are not lost yet, they all are inherently involved in normal cells in this regulatory pathway. That is, for example, if you cut yourself, cells wake up, try to divide, fill up the gap, and try to mend that, 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 that wound. And so in normal cells, when the signal goes, uh, it tells the cells to go ahead and divide, all these proto-oncogenes will wake up, turn on the program, and then coordinate, bringing in energy, building all the building blocks for cells to grow. So the question is, or how, how is it that these cells are different in the way they use energy than cancer cells? And so um, what we know is that as we evolve, um, the, the organisms are really adapt to starvation, for example. There have been long periods of starvation where you know that the animal actually go into a phase that you can rest, put everything at rest, then wait until the energy supply comes back, food supply comes back, and then you go uh, scurrying for that. So our cells can do the same thing, normal cells. When they know there's not enough energy, they retreat back into a resting state to wait when the food comes back. And in fact, there's a process uh, in a, a, some other session here where some of the cells, when they go to rest, they actually start eating themselves to, to garner the energy uh, to try to survive until new energy comes in. The difference between normal cells and cancer cells is that in the cancer cells, these breaks and accelerators are all either stuck or broken. So what, that, what happens there is that the signal from the oncogenes and tumor suppressors basically is telling the cells, go ahead and grow. Don't worry about the nutrients. Okay, that's what happens when these things are broken. So activation of MYC or other oncogenes tells the cells to continue to grow, disregard whether the nutrients are available or not. Fortunately, in our body, um, because of food substances and digestion, our cells are always bathed in nutrients because we eat. So the cancer cells enjoy all these nutrients all the time. So the question is, if the cancer cells are addicted to growing, that means they're always going to be demanding for food, can we go in and look at how we can actually interrupt that uh, uh, fuel line? So I think what, what our work has led us to is that um, 
when you start to look at the pathways by which MYC regulates, you start seeing that it not only regulates genes that build up parts of the cells, but also genes that brings in nutrients, particularly glucose and glutamine. That's a new finding for MYC. And so these um, fuel sources actually comes in to feed the glycolytic pathway. Glutamine comes in to feed the TCA cycle. And these are the two very main pathways that have always been taught in biochemistry, except we don't quite understand it until uh, more recently how these pathways that con contribute to, to cell growth in terms of building blocks. And I think the excitement here is that we're starting to see these pathways much more clearly. And the fact that cancer cells are addicted to these pathways, we now have an opportunity to go in and target these fuel lines at specific points that would distinguish them from normal cells, because normal cells, when they sense they don't have nutrients, they go to rest. Cancer cells, when you hit these fuel lines, they still think they have fuel, so they're going to try to continue to build in the absence of any energy at all. They exhaust themselves out of energy and then die. And so that's the kind of the large conceptual framework that we've been working on to really look for new therapeutic opportunities. And would you discuss your work identifying those target genes of CMYC and their significance on tumorigenesis and cancer therapeutic responses? Right. Yeah, so, so I can get to details here. So, um, um, it's amazing how technology actually has given us a real deep glimpse into what's going on in cancer cells. So some 15 years ago, we didn't have all the tools to look at multitudes of genes at the same time. So when we uh, start looking to the problem of just very simply asking the question, how is it that MEC contributes to the formation of tumors like breast cancers, for example? So we take very simple models so we can engineer. We can take a relatively normal cell we then pump into it by genetic means, molecular biology means, to really crank up MEC. And then the cells begin to, begun to uh, behave as if it's a cancer cell. So being able to manipulate the system, we actually compare the non-transformed cells to the MYC transformed cells, and then use uh, techniques back then to ask, okay, what are the genes that are elevated when you turn on MEC constitutively? And by subtraction cloning, this is before the advent of new technologies where we can look at tens of thousands of genes at the same time. Back then, there's no that such tool. You can't just order it. So basically, we use old techniques where we have to do what is called subtraction cloning. And we discovered uh, about 20 genes that uh, were differentially uh, induced by MEC. And one of these genes happened to be a gene that encodes a critical enzyme in the utilization of glucose. And this is back in 1997. Uh, back then, you can only do a few genes at a time. So since that time, uh, we know we established back then, and I believe it was the first connection between, that is a first mechanistic connection between an oncogene and metabolism that's connected. So since that time, we've been quite obsessed in trying to understand how this critical oncogene regulates all of metabolism. So we began to look, to, uh, look at all of the glucose metabolic pathways and found that in, in essence, this central switch turns on almost every genes that is, are required to use glucose. So basically, for a long time, it's known that this oncogene turns on the cell cycle machinery, the machinery that tells the cells to divide, divide, divide. Now we've linked it to the machinery that says, take in glucose and burn it up and use it as energy. And so um, because of this, um, we start looking at uh, very globally, because now we can look at tens of thousands, literally 20,000 genes at the same time. And with new technologies, we're able to get even deeper and start to see that many of the genes that MYC regulates specifically are genes that are also involved in other metabolic pathways, including the mitochondrion, the powerhouse of the cell. And so um, we've been looking at to ask the question, if this gene, this major oncogene, is almost like a symphony director who basically goes in and start up the symphony. So we want to know what other parts of the symphony is playing in this bioenergetic uh, um, pathways. And so um, we found that many genes involved in uh, mitochondrial function are activated in MYC. We then in, went in and looked at experiments to see if MYC actually, while it charged up the cells, does it actually cause the powerhouse to duplicate? Because the more the, more the cells wants to grow, the more energy you have to produce. So you need to more powerhouses, more mitochondria. And indeed, we found that when you turn MEC on a number system, the mitochondria start to divide. They start to increase in numbers. So that already tells us that here is a central switch that does 
multiple things. And um, uh, about uh, several years ago, um, once we found that this MYC gene can cause cells to make more mitochondria, we asked whether the mitochondria themselves are altered by MYC. That is, are the components of it uh, altered? Would it, does MYC really optimize the way mitochondria function? And to do this, again, we resort to new technologies not available back uh, about 10 years ago. And uh, in this case, we use proteomics. So first we use gene arrays, the genomic stuff, and now we turn to proteomics. So what we did was we took cells that have high MYC or low MYC, purified the mitochondria, and then we subject this to analysis of looking at literally thousands of proteins that are within the mitochondria from a low MYC state and a high MYC state. And then we want to know whether there are proteins that are occur at different levels in the same mitochondria. And indeed, we found uh, almost 10 different proteins that are highly elevated when you turn MEC on. And it turns out when we characterize one of these proteins by mass spectrometry, it is an enzyme that's critical for the use of glutamine. So this is an amino acid that circulates in your blood like many other amino acids. So this is in addition to glucose. It turns out that glutamine, which is the highest concentration amino acids circulating about. You have 20 amino acids, but glutamine is the highest one. And it turns out that glutamine also is utilized not just in amino acids to build up proteins, but glutamine itself can be broken down by the processes that breaks down glucose as an energy. So glutamine can be used both as a building block and also as an energy substrate. So having trace this into the, the metabolic pathways, we now have a picture where the central switch, switching on the engine and, and the brakes, and also switch all everything in to bring the fuel in. Okay, so it's really, a, 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 like I said, a, a symphony director. But I think the conceptual framework that led us to think and believe more that targeting metabolism is, is um, probably feasible is the whole idea that when MYC is always on in cancer cells, such as in subsets of breast cancers, these cancer cells basically are instructed to build and build and build, just like the stock market. Went up and up and up, build out of nothing, and then when the energy goes away, it collapses. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to exploit ways to actually interrupt the fuel lines so that the cells thinks that it has fuel, and it will try to build, but it's trying to build things out of nothing, and when the ATP in the cells dropped below a certain level, the cells will just implode and, and die, basically. Um, so, so that's where all of our work in genomics, now more proteomics, has led us. Um, one more comment is that, but this is not sufficient because we have also new technologies uh, to look at all the metabolites in the cells. We have genes, proteins, but then when we use uh, metabolism, these are all the metabolites that becomes uh, the important things in the cells because the cells has to know how to process glucose, a six carbon molecule breaks it down. So now with new technology, you actually can look at literally again, thousands of metabolites at a single shot in that single experiment. And this is all new technologies now that allows us to use metabolomics to begin to understand how a cancer cell works and how is it different from a normal cell. And so we're starting to get into this now and all the metabolomic studies so far substantiate what we have implied by simply from the gene uh, studies so far. So, that's, so this is a very exciting area to, uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be in at the moment. Uh, and that was my next question. How can we therapeutically exploit the understanding of CMIC, oncogene, and cancer right. metabolism? Yeah, so as already um, alluded to, um, the, the, what I would call a biomass accumulation demand, that is a, a switch that says build, 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 and then this switch also turns all the genes that brings in nutrients, but then you have to have a flow of nutrients from the outside. Um, this, the, the cells can't make its own nutrients. And um, so once we understand which are some of the critical nutrients that the cells critically need, we start to look at these pathways and say, if glucose is important, can we hit some of the points as glucose gets into the cells and being processed to be used, or glutamine, can we then kill the cells that have deregulated MYC. And indeed, this is what we saw. If you take cells that have high MYC versus low MYC, you take away glucose, the cells that have low MYC, the normal cells, they just retreat and go to rest. The cells with high MYC, literally they die. They just basically, uh, they're so addicted to it that they run out of energy very quickly and then they start dying. Similarly, um, you can take glutamine away and the cells also die. But the question is, how do we do this in a way 
uh, in an organism, in, in a human being, right? You can't just deprive a person of glucose, other organs needs it. Um, and then, oh, the same thing with glutamine. You can't just take glutamine away, it's part of the, the body's needs. So what we're interested in more is to see which of these pathways are distinctly different between normal cells and, and cancer cells. And so the, the glucose utilization pathway that most cancers use are switched on not only by MYC but other, other factors. Uh, it also turns out that most tumors are somewhat deficient in oxygen. And the reason for this is as a tumor grows, uh, blood vessels grows in to try to feed it. So the blood vessels that, that grows into a tumor is not like our normal blood vessels. Our normal blood vessels are very well structured to feed normal tissues. So in essence, what happens is that the tumor is a very uh, undeveloped um, uh, organ, if you will. It's, it's actually an organ. It has blood comes in, blood comes back out. Except for the blood vessels are so abnormal that a lot of the cells in a tumor, in fact, don't get enough oxygen. So they try to thrive and try to build things under limited oxygen concentration. And this is why their metabolic pathway is a little different than a normal tissue. And this is where some of these enzymes that I talk about, such as LDHA, which is one we work on, hexokinase 2, another critical enzyme for, for glucose uh, metabolism, are highly elevated in tumors as compared to surrounding tissues. So that gives us a therapeutic window. So now if we hit these enzymes and we do it right, we should be able to minimize toxicity and really uh, knock at the door at, of these cancer cells because they're addicted to, to glucose. And we're, we've begun now to also explore points in glutamine metabolism, mm -hmm. critical enzymes, that may distinguish between tumors and, and normal cells. And in fact, the nice thing about this field is like going back to the future. Um, when a metabolism was very popular back in the 1970s and 80s, early 80s, before the discovery of oncogenes and tumor suppressors, that's all most people can do in terms of cancer biologists. They study metabolism, because that's the body of knowledge we had. So if you go back in the literature and look at some of the things that were found, it actually is quite intriguing, because there's some observations that's already been in the old literature, but it's never been tied now up to what we know about oncogenes and tumor suppressors. So I think the challenge now is to try to link what was known then, what we know now, and then also to take new technologies of metabolomics to really deeply understand the metabolic profiles of cancers. So if you look in the future, what I see is that um, we should be able to use new technology of metabolomics to take a patient's tissue and characterize that tumor in terms of its metabolic status, okay? Is it addicted to glucose? Is it addicted to glutamine? In fact, I never talk about this, even in the talk I gave. Was, is it addicted to fatty acids? Fatty acids also feed cells too, so some tumors Breast cancer, for example, may be dependent on fatty acids that's circulating. So once we know these profiles, we should be able to tailor uh, metabolic therapies to these tumors in combination with standard therapy, because I don't think any of this is going to work alone. It's, uh, these tumors are very deranged. They're going to use any means to survive and grow. So we need to understand the personality, if you will, of each, and then to, to then tailor therapy to these tumors. So hopefully in the next five years, we'll see that even among breast cancers, there'll be some that are glucose addicted, others will be glutamine addicted, and so on, so on. And we should be able to develop new reagents to then start to see if this works in an experimental setting. And I really hope, uh, and this is where our focus is to really take some of these agents into clinic. Um, Thank you so much, Dr. Dari.